hard work. That was good. Well, uh, I know that Dr. Bavakwa and his and his kids are very artistic. It's probably <laughs> one of his kids. <laughs> oh, nice. oh, I think the live stream is on Nengon Rato. Let's check this now. Turn the print again. Oh, yep, Eniki. All right, we are live. Woohoo. All right. Buenas and half a day todos hamzuni ume ekung zanu me ega estin episode fanatsu. Why host me zutalo? I am again your host for fanatsu. Uh, uh, thank you for tuning in, for watching. We have an exciting panel. And I'm always really, really excited when the panel is much more interesting than anything I have to say. And I guarantee that that is one of those episodes. We have some very cool, very creative people that are joining from across all sorts of time zones. And, you know, what's really exciting about this, the topic is the Legends of Guam podcast plays series from Breaking Wave Theater. And, you know, if you grew up on Guam, you have some sense of the legends of this island, the legends of the Chamorro people, right? Maybe it's just Punta Andosa Montes, right? Maybe it's just Two Lovers Point. Maybe you know the Serena story. Maybe the Serena story speaks to you because you would rather be swimming than sitting in a classroom, or maybe just because you fought with your mother all the time. Tiotung, I don't know. But these legends speak to us, right? And the great thing is, even if you're not Chamorro, you can still embrace these legends as coming from the place that you love. But one thing that we often miss, though, is that legends survive and thrive because they're stories that appeal across time and generations. Sometimes people feel that if you change a legend, it's lost. But the purpose of legends are really that these are stories that every generation takes a little bit differently, yep. right? And this is something, this is why legends are not just about telling it the old way, but it's also about finding new ways to tell these stories, new ways to adapt them, right? Because the Serena story may have sounded very different to my great grandmother compared to the way it sounds to my kids, right? Because the values might be a little bit different. Technology is a little bit different, right? Um, and so that's why I'm so excited to be uh, here with sort of the crew that has put together, helped put together the podcast plays, the Legends of Guam series, because uh, they're doing that. They're taking sort of stories that come from the Chamorro people, that come from the Marianas, and they are giving it sort of a, a new sort of a, a new shine. You know, they're giving it new spirit, new energy, and they're putting it in ways in which a lot of people want to consume their their information nowadays, right? In podcasts. And so, Sidzus Masinu Hamzu Todos, thank you all for joining. And so let's uh let's give you each a chance to sort of introduce yourselves and what your role is in breaking wave or in the in the podcast plays. And so let's start off with uh Joyce. Half a day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joyce Torres. Uh, she, her, hers. I am part of the board of directors for Breaking Wave Theater Company. I was also the artistic director for the Legends of Guahan uh, podcast plays, as well as a director for two of the five that were presented. And yeah, I'm so excited. I feel like I'm just a storyteller like everyone else. And I get to hang out with other cool storytellers and um, we get to talk shop and we got to do some really cool stuff with the podcast plays. And speaking of which, I'll hand it over to our other director who um, got to direct with me. But before I hand it over to Jaina, I will shout out Miss Sierra O'Neill, who was director number two out. Um, she directed um, two as well during the series. And then now I'll hand it off to Jaina. Thank you. Hafade, Guahusi Jaina Shodemeyer. Uh, I was a uh, director of episode three of the Legends of Guahan podcast plays. Um, and I'm also working with Breaking Wave on the oral storytelling project along with Joyce, which is super exciting. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm a student at Boston University. I'm studying theater, uh, but a little bit about me. My family comes from Saipan and Guam, but I was raised in the diaspora. So like the three pillars, <laughs> the, three, the three pillars of the Chamorro experience, I feel like I, I really resonate with. Um, and yeah, it was such a joy to work on this project because I grew up with this storybook of the Serena story that had a CD that my grandma gave me and I would play it on repeat. 
So when I heard about the podcast plays, I was really excited to uh, join the team because it was something I could work on when I was out in the States. Um, and I was fortunate enough, I was able uh, to go back to Guam this summer and I was uh, staying with my grandparents there. So I was there for the recording sessions, which was super exciting. After weeks of rehearsing over Zoom, I got to meet my actors in person. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm seeing your whole body and not just your head. So uh, yeah, it was such a joy to be a part of this process. Uh, and I really appreciate how Breaking Wave creates opportunities for uh, Chamorros who are based out in the diaspora as well. I will pass it over to Reed. Yeah, coffee day everyone. In honor of Reed Flores. Uh, I wrote a group of badass mermaids who saved the whole ass island, um, <laughs> as told by Auntie Bobby. Um, I, I'm a writer, I'm a director, I'm based out in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, specifically on the land of the Ramatush Ohlone people. Um, and I am just so excited to be here. And likewise, Jaina, like, I grew up, my mom had told me the story of, the story of Serena, and um, my favorite song growing up was the Johnny Sablon song. So when it ended up in, <laughs> in Badass Mermaids, I was, I was very, very excited. Um, anyway, very excited to be here. I'll pass it off to Bree. Tito Smasi Reed. Um, well, I first want to say um Tito Smasi to Dr. Bravakwa, uh Nyon Kambida do uh Gi Programo Fanatsu. Uh Buenas Tatis uh Kwasi Bri Baza Tata Telefofuzu familia Labutsu, uh Tenorio family, who assisted the fine arts with the emphasis in arts, but I dahuna you like to dabble dabble in the you know dabble <laughs> in uh you know the other parts of the arts artistic umbrella such as theater and music but I'm still very new and I voiced Auntie Bobby in the last episode episode five the young maidens um as well as two other characters Naili and Maria um and um I just I would like to first thank four or four, three of you, four of you, but like I never met Jaina before and Reed. Um, I'm like the little baby of this like whole thing because I just like started and I'm just so stoked to be a part of this uh, project, which is very necessary. And um, yeah, excited to be here. Thank you. Sidus Masi, Sidus Masi, and Esther Kelling, Mem Professional Hamzu, you're all like Zoom professionals because you all passed it back, you know, to each other. Usually it's on big panels, especially with older people, right? It's like, oh, who would like to introduce themselves? And people just kind of stare. Oh, well, me, me. Oh, uh, okay. And then, uh, but so that was, that was smooth and seamless, Kelling. It's, it's like you're used to the Zoom stage, I swear. And so, Sidus Masi, now tell me how this got started, right? Because as many of you have shared, the legends ha are, have been put into different forms, CDs, songs, books, right? And then sort of oral history as well. So how did this start, this idea of putting it into a podcast play series, right? And, and uh, who, can, who, can, who can break that down? Who can tell us the genesis of this? Who's the Fauna and Puntan? Knife for, for this. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> I guess I can go. Um, no, it's, you know, Breaking Wave, honoring the community, honoring our culture, and honoring just Guam to the best of our abilities has always been like the forefront, right? And to realize that we might be, you know, there's nothing micro about being Micronesian. And so, how can we gather all the amazing talent? that Guam has provided, right? The lineage and all of that. How can we kind of start to bring that all into the same space? And I, I will say again, the pandemic, we're still in it. It was gross. It was not, 10 out of 10 would not recommend, do not want my children's children have to go through it. But I will say there was something really beautiful about when the pressure is on and your options are limited, there's something about, there's something about it that pushes you and demands change demands pivot um and encourages you to think differently 
And I think we were already, as you mentioned, right, why are we also Zoom, right? There's Zoom etiquette, there's Zoom, you know, ways of doing things. So random, beginning in 2020, no one knew how to open up a laptop, <laughs> you know what I mean? And now you have, you know, our, our, our elders just on the Zoom doing the FaceTime, like it's so beyond, right? Time, things are moving and, and things are growing and, and really interesting ways that we didn't think would connect us. And I think when we started this project, which was about a year and a half out now at this point, um, we were still in the middle of the pandemic, right? So it's like, why are you doing a podcast? Why is it on a stage? And it's, which is understandable. We do want to put more things on the stage, but at the time we were very limited. We didn't know if we were going to leave our houses soon, right? We're still level five shut down, like even as I'm thinking about it, I'm giving myself PTSD about <laughs> we can't leave the home. Um, but anyway, so it was just right. We were, we have at BWTC, we do like plan a year in advance, two years in advance. So this was something that's already been on the docket. And we were like, we wanted to do Guam legends. We knew that was something that we we're like, there's, there's so great. The storytelling is so great. How can we do it during a pandemic? And then they brought up Zoom. And we're like, ah, Zoom is so like Zoom is great, but I think by 2021 we were zoomed out. And around that time, we were like, well, there's something really cool about podcasts during this pandemic too, right? Of like being on your phone is just overwhelming sometimes. And you just want to be in a medium that encourages you to think. And I think there's something about audio that really like challenges you to do that. And so we were like, why don't we do the podcast plays or some variation of that? And we do legends and we looked at it, we looked around, we we're like, what legend that we have now is currently set for this medium? And the truth was there really kind of wasn't. So how do you take something that there isn't a space for? How do you move forward with that? And we said as a collective, well, why don't we start from the very beginning and walk through a process of bringing together a random group of writers, bringing together writers to write stuff. And then workshopping that and then casting. And just so it's from the very beginning and just kind of like take it upon ourselves. And it just so happened, honestly, by chance that the play, the legends that we had chosen were wanted, the writers wanted to write about. And then the writers that came in, like the amazing Reed, we'll hand it over to in a second, kind of came in and just said, well, if y'all are game, we're game. Let's try something new. And I actually want to hand it over to Reed read what made because thinking about it now at the other side even though I think we successfully did it what made you go this could potentially work and okay what are these wacko people doing trying to you know change up change up the storytelling what what invite what made you want to kind of join in on that and um yeah I want to hear parts of your process I I've I've only got to chat with Reed twice I think during the workshop and session um so I want to know yeah man Uh, well Funny enough, it was it was really out of necessity that I signed on to the project, you know, like spiritually, artistically, you know, I had been telling people, I introduced myself all the time in my biographies, Reed Flores is a queer Chamorro director and writer. And I, I reached out to a, another Chamorro creative and they were like, what makes you Chamorro? What makes you Chamorro writer and director? What have you done that's Chamorro? And I was, at first I was really like taken aback, but then it it sent me into like an actual journey of saying, if I claim it, how do I uplift it? And it, it was, it was that kind of journey that was like, I need to do this thing. I will say though, because it, how the plays were handed out, it was kind of like, what's your preference? What are you thinking of? And for me, this was not on my preference. Like, I don't think I was going to do Young Maidens. For me, I was like, you know what? Like, this is really isn't my narrative. Like, I'm not femme presenting. I'm not female identifying. Like, this isn't for me. You know what I mean? And I, in my mind, it needs to be a femme forward narrative. And then when it got handed to me, I was like, well, man, I guess the person that's going to tell the story isn't me. It's going to be my mom. <laughs> Um, and um, I don't know when I, when I started writing it actually Anti Bobby wasn't even there yet I was writing it and I got feedback on the first draft you remember the first draft which was like rough 
I got it. I got feedback and people send it back and they're like, what is this? <laughs> they're like, it's funny, but what is it? And I was like, that's a good point. Who's telling this story? And um, it was, it was kind of this creative journey that was like, it can't be me who leads us through this story. It needs to be someone who gets it. And um, for me, Auntie Bobby, my mom, one told me the story and also um, she was the one who taught me a lot of lessons in my life. So I thought who better, who better than the, uh, the matriarchs? Yeah. Any, any thought? Wait, Brie, I ha- I've never talked to yes. Brie. Brie, who was on the Bobby. <laughs> take it take it i'm oh, sorry because <laughs> yeah. I, I need to i need to um compose myself because i was about to cry um it's just it's almost as if i was meant to be auntie bobby because a lot of what she embodies is so me and if i when i read the character description and i looked at her age range it says 30s or early 30s late 20s i was like that's me then it says you know, she has a lot of siblings or whatever. I'm actually in that part. I'm not the youngest of 15. I'm the eldest of three. But I'm, you know, I, I know, I know exactly what, how Auntie Bobby feels because I've gone through it. I am a survival of sexual assault, but I kind of don't let that get to me. I kind of convert it and I turn it into art or lessons for my kids so when um, when I saw the the flyer for the for the cast the voice casting calls, I said mm, this is something that I'm not really comfortable doing, but I needed to get out of my comfort zone in order to grow as a person and as an artist. And I'm tired of hiding because I'm very shy, very mamalo, but uh, my spirit is very much willing and very loud. So by um, taking the opportunity to audition. I said, I think it's time for, for me to do something out of my comfort zone. Then when I was working with Ciara O'Neill, Ciara O'Neill, she's the director, she kind of helped bring that out of me. She helped bring that Auntie Bobby out of me, which was therapeutic for me. And when in the story, in the play, Auntie Bobby finds therapy in telling her story to her niece. So... I thought it was very beautiful and very comedic at the same time because I got to cuss and I I cuss on the daily, but not because I'm mad. I cuss when I'm excited. I cuss when I'm disgusted. I cuss when I'm alone. You know, when you stub your foot, when you stub your toe on the the corner of the bed or something, like the first word is like, you know, the F word, but I like to cuss in Chamorro now. So now my son's picking it up. I'm like, I think I should tone it down. So anyway, um, yeah. But the more I learned about Auntie Bobby, the more I um, kind of was in tune with my own traumas. And that's the beautiful thing about this whole um, this whole thing, this whole project, is you want to feel connected to them on a personal level, on a cultural level, on a community level. So, yeah, I am very grateful to be you know a part of this. And I'm, I hope that there's more like this in the future. Because I wouldn't mind playing either a, a role like Auntie Bobby or something completely opposite. Because, you know, I'm still exploring. <clears throat> so, yeah, thank you. And I can I can definitely uh, sympathize with that. I mean, my my kids went to school going like, Lanya, Lanya. And then their Chamorro teachers are like, oh, you know, your your father is, is a Chamorro teacher. Didn't yeah. he teach you? That that's a bad word. <laughs> And they're like, and then, and then, and then they're, and then Sumai was like, wait, Lanya, Baba, na Palabra, Satfino, that's a bad word. That's a cuss word. And I'm like, oh, it's Ben said so. Timaulik Nasaina zo. Not a good parent. <laughs> Not a but good like, parent. Like the bigger, like, at least we're, we're <laughs> speaking the language, right? Even if it's. That's true. You, that's yeah. true. You know, you know that when they land on the on on Mars, it's going to be Elon Musk. His head is going to be in some hyperbaric chamber kept alive a hundred years from now, right? You know that once they 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 touch down, somebody in the back is going to yell "Biba," because there's <laughs> going to be some tomorrow on that flight. There's, there's Maybe he's that there to, to make whatever space age food they're making make it 
taste like finadeni or something like that, or, you know, sort of bring back yeah. to life the red rice. Who knows? But just throw the Nancy on it. Yeah. <laughs> just like tomorrow go. rice, almost everything, you know. <laughs> there you go. And I do want to thank you so much, uh, everyone. I do want to share and remind everyone, and I'm going to put onto the, the links for everyone to check it out. So if you haven't seen it yet, sort of these are the legends of Guam. This is their anchor page. You can listen to it on Spotify. And there are five, I believe, correct? Five that have been released so far. Mm -hmm. And so you have Kuntan and Fauna, the Trunkun Nidzuk, the Lemai, Trunkun Lemai adaption. And that's one that not as many people know, the legend of the of the Lemai. So that was very nice to, to listen to. Chaifi's Lost Soul, and then, as, we, as was mentioned, sort of the, the, the women who saved Guam from the giant fish. Or, as it's put here, the group of badass mermaids and their maiden buddy that saved the whole ass island. <laughs> and so... By your Auntie Bobby. <laughs> and so, I know that you... Uh, so, let's, let's talk about some of these choices for these legends, right? So... Because one thing that uh, when I was sharing this, one thing that somebody asked is, how come there's no uh, Punta and Dos Amantes? How come there's no uh, Two Lovers Point, right? And so, but but so why specifically were these chosen? I understand. And so uh, I know that somebody wants to share their writing process or their selection process. Yeah, it's a little hard. So what happened was, so I ended up becoming the artistic director a little maybe midway of the workshopping process. So I wasn't there at the the inception in the very, very beginning. So I wasn't in that room. So I got there by the time the the writers already begun writing and I had to be like, okay, someone needs to take up the torch to to continue the project on. But I from my my understanding, I think when they selected the legends, I want to say it was something either with um some variation of creation or like the beginnings. And only because origin we knew stories. that we weren't, which one? Origin stories. I remember hearing. Or like that. some variation yeah. of origin, some variation of origin. And then also because there was this understanding that ideally <laughs> this wouldn't be the last of the series. So there would be pockets of other things. I think that was what the pipeline was, the, the dream was. Um, but yes, it's a variation of an origin story or a beginnings. Um, and then just the different I guess, leaping points into that. And um, there were so, again, this is a process that we, so uh, in true breaking wave form, <laughs> navigating unseen spaces and, and really not knowing what to expect. Because here's the thing, and I, thinking about it now, it sounds very chaotic. And why, why were we like this? Um, but we kind of went into this space, giving the writers kind of freedom to say, listen, Yes, there, there are so many ways you can tell this story. Um, but what happens, you know, we have to ask the question, what happens if we don't give, right, a, 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 a direction you had to go and see what inspires you and see what from your experience or your, um, how you connect to the legend that you were tasked with? How can we bring this into the space and talk about it in a way that not only encourages or celebrates the previous way the legend has been told, but makes it not tangible because they're all tangible, but what, how can we, how can we add to this story? And I, I think, especially for the legend of Lemai, which I want to hear from Jaina from what was so cool. Again, this thing of like, it seems so by chance or like, you know, like nothing is supposed to happen. I mean, Jaina and I were in a meeting and she's like, Joyce, check this out in her grandmother's home there was a lemmy like carving like when what world and jana's like i've never noticed that carving in this house before but of course as we're talking about this project and that she was directing it of course there's some variation of a carving of this story and so i think right and, and here's the thing just be i hear you people i i everyone that saw the cast posting they are the most interacted posts that we have they are the most commented or talked about that we have um so Guan, we hear you people want to hear more of our stories they want to see more of ourselves in these different mediums and again i think it's so cool um jana and i for most of this process were not even 
on Guam, um, but rehearsing with people like Jane and I were up at midnight. I was up at like two or three o'clock Nashville time in the morning and then would go to work at seven. It was a wild, wild, wild experience, but so remember, necessary and helpful. Yeah. Our casting meeting, it was 2 a.m. Boston time. So it was like we we're meeting from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. because it was L.A., Guam. Sorry, there's a bunch of cars honking outside. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> but um, and, and Sierra was in London. So, you know, we're like working across time zones to to bring these stories together. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in here about the, um, the Lemai adaptation. Um, and something I think is so cool about, about all of these podcasts and about the form itself is that being adaptations, they really bring these legends into like a, a present day perspective. And I, I keep thinking about how like culture is alive. Um, and, and while these are things that happened in the past and they're stories from the past, you know, we're bringing them into present day and we're saying like, what do they mean to us now? Um, and I, I didn't know the Lemai legend when I was, uh, when I, when I signed on to, to direct, which is so funny because <laughs> my grandma had, it's true, this huge carving, two huge carvings, uh, these wooden carvings and, um, the Lemai, uh, the Lemai legend it's, itself for this particular episode, it combined uh, the playwright Robin Burl combined influences from uh, from a Palauan legend around the trunk of Mamai and also elements of of Chamorro stories around it as well. So she was she was kind of like merging these two things to bring it into this this uh, adapted form um, where it feels like the story could be set in a distant past, it could be set in the present, or it could be set in a very scary future. Um, which, which may not be like, it feels very real. It feels very relatable to me. Um, and so uh, it, was, it was really special to, to work with this story because the, the episode I directed follows a young couple who live in a village uh, where they have chosen, the community has chosen not to have kids because they all went through a famine and they didn't have the resources to, to support and sustain life. Um, and so rather than struggling to, sur to survive, they, they wanted to ensure that uh, the quality of life people had was better. So they stopped having kids. Um, and it follows this couple as, as they're approaching a new era, a new, era, a new they're, they're an emerging generation and, and they want to bring children back into the village. But, uh, but they're, they're, there's a lot of fear in that, like the fear of not being able to provide, the fear of a potential mother about not being able to to give the life that she wants for her kids, the fears of her children going through the past traumas that she had. Um, and I think for, um, like for me as, as a Chamorro woman, like I, I think about like what culture am I passing on? Like what can I provide for my, for, for future kids? I'm, I'm not a mother yet. <laughs> I'm not near that, but, but it's just something, it's something that, that I feel like I, I think about, you know, the importance of family and providing for your family was a value that was strongly distilled in, in me and my upbringing through my family. And I feel like that theme is so strong um, in this episode and the way that Robin wrote it. Um, and I see similar things in, in a lot of the other episodes, like, oh my gosh, Reed, when I read your script, I was like, oh, I remember reading it for the first time when we're just going through drafts. And I was like, this is so good because it's, it's funny and it's entertaining, but it's real and it's addressing really real issues that we see in society. And I think that's what, that's what I love about doing theater. Like as a theater artist, I, 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 I understand that theater can be entertainment, theater can be fun, theater can be escapism, but it can also reflect reality. And it, can, it, it, is, it is a place where you can experience community with the people you're creating with and with your audience. Uh, and so it was really fun exploring that in the form of a podcast play because I feel like it's a very accessible art form. Uh, it's a way in which anyone on island can listen to it and anyone who's away from home can listen to it and hear the sounds of home, uh, which is a really, really beautiful thing. That resonated so much, Gina. <laughs> I, I especially and, uh, love those plates. Oh, Go ahead. oh sorry. Uh, yes, Reed, I definitely uh, want to pass it off to you now, but it is uh, thank you though, for sharing about sort of the, the thinking behind the ones that were chosen. Now I can really see that sort of there. Because each of them is kind of a like an origin or takes you back to kind of a beginning yeah. um, mm -hmm. in a certain way. So I, I can definitely see that. And and yes, I, I definitely want to hear more about the thinking behind the, you know, the, the badass women, if I'm allowing the one that saved <laughs> Guam, just because. And this is uh, 
you know, building off of what we've already shared uh, so far, you know, uh, for me, thinking about a few generations ago, sort of one of the most important Chamorro legends uh, was sort of, uh, at least in terms of thinking about culture, right? So like when I think about uh, Chamorro activism in the 80s and 90s, it was very much Godao. It was very much men sort of standing up. Like you think of Angel Santos and you think of Magalahi Godao, Chief Godao, right? But the stories of Godao are so masculine and of a certain type that it doesn't seem to quite fit with sort of what we think about Chamorro culture, right? Or what we know, even the Spanish acknowledged that Chamorro culture was matrilineal. So what is what is it with all these sort of dudes hanging out, you know, hanging out, you know, showing off their Teresa's pakpak and stuff like that? What is this? This isn't, you know, this doesn't seem to match what we know, right? So thinking then, uh, I wrote an article once talking about how Looking at today and Chamorro activism, it's much more in line with the legend of the women who saved Guam with the giant fish, in the sense that sort of if you look at groups like uh, We Are Guahan in the past, even if you look at groups like Protehi Latexan now, you know, a lot of these are female driven. They're not top down. It's not sort of one person who's above everyone else telling everyone what to do. They're much horizontal, sort of in their focus, much more focused on collective action. And so that's why I, I really enjoyed sort of uh, the the fifth episode, the Badass Famalawan episode, because it really kind of spoke to the changes, even in our own sense of culture and values. And so I definitely want to uh, tell, tell us more. Tell us more. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I, I will say that it the reason it became so clear to me is kind of what you said, the the recognition that tomorrow culture is matrilineal culture like in in my in my narrative the heroes like of course are my my father and my brothers but they're really my mom right like when i think of who we look at for decisions or or who has the power who who who's going to guide us I, I, we looked at our mom a lot um and my mom felt the same way about her mom that, that that's kind of built into badass mermaids right um, even though Auntie Bobby has a trauma with with um, her grandma or with grandma, with her mom, there's still a, a, an element of love and respect and a recognition that I looked at this woman as someone who was supposed to protect me, correct? Um, it's kind of built in into the culture. At least that's that's how I, how I was writing it. Brie, you unmuted. I want to hear it. Oh, yeah, sure. So, you know, when I take a look at the, the script, right, um, there's a part there where the, the male, the pescador, starts to cry. I thought that was hilarious. But at the same time, I kind of saw it like as a reflection of, I think it's time for a man to take a break because they carry so much on their shoulders for so long, for so, for so many generations that, you know, even, even heroes bleed, you know, so... So when the pescador, when the when the fisherman started to cry because he he can't catch the big fish, that's when you know um, he he ran away. When the, the female mermaid, what's her name? Um, mermaid one, what's her name? I forgot, I forgot her name. Sarah was it? Sarah? She played. Oh, anyway, um, she, the way that she introduced herself, that she approached the 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 pescador, was kind of funny because she's like, "Why are you crying?" You know, you don't expect a man to cry, but he's crying. So he's like, why are you crying? And he's like, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do this. And she's like, well, and then he runs away. And then he's like, mermaids are me. Remember that? Yeah, I, I just, <laughs> that was so funny. But it was also empowering. I'm not saying that, it's not saying that men are weak. Men are crybabies. It's showing that even men cry and that's okay. That's okay. But, and it's almost, it's kind of, um, it is empowering in a way that the women the uh, came together to try to solve the problem because that's that's how I see um, how issues are issues are being solved today, you know, and it, it it ties in with the whole matriarchal role of of the women in our community to kind of help our men out, not leaving them out, but helping them out because that's what us that's what I do in my my household. That's how our women, our ancient women, did it too. They didn't dismiss the men you know they worked 
together. They kind of held, they held things together, just like how I hold my house together. So I really appreciated um, me being a part of this specific um, play. I love all of them, by the way, especially the Lemmy one. That one took me on an emotional roller coaster. I was, I was listening to the Lemmy legend while I was driving. And I was by myself and on my way to class and I started to cry. I texted my professor, I can't come in today. <laughs> I'm a mess. You know, I'm not sick. Oh my gosh, yeah. you're joking. Oh. I'm not joking. That's how impactful it was. And the acting was so good, the voice acting. With me, I, I had only one challenge during my recording session. I thought I had a, I had a COVID scare. I lost my voice the week of final recording at UOG in the recording room. But I, I kept... Uh, trying to cure my voice, you know, all the lemon, all the, you know, all the remedies, because I wanted to really nail it. And then, <clears throat> yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to like say that I'm, it sucked, but I know I could do better. Definitely. I kept listening to it over and over again, because, you know, as artists, sometimes we're our, we're our worst critics, right? I'm like, oh, I, I can't listen to myself, you know, but I, 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 it's, it's constructive. So this is a growing experience for me as, as a person, as a woman, as a mom, as an auntie, because I do have nieces that I'm very close to. And I do talk to my nieces the way that Auntie Bobby talks to her niece, which was really, it made it easy for me to be Auntie Bobby because I am Auntie Bobby in a way. Oh, Sidus Masi. Uh, Jaina, did you want to respond to that? I know that you were... Because, uh, I mean, that's uh, that's great feedback, you know, when people feel it sort of even on that level. Yeah. You know, and, and I, that's, uh, that's a t oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sure, yeah, I just agree, I relate. Like, as artists, we definitely are our own worst critics because uh, by the time the podcast play was released, I had, like, listened to it a thousand times. Like, I, I had heard the Chunkin Lemai episode over and over and over again that I reached a point, I was like, is this conveying what I hope it's conveying? Like, is this, is it clear? Like it just, you know, it reaches a point where it's like, you can't, it's, you, you can't look at it with a, without a, a um, it's so ingrained that it's, it's hard to hear the nuance at a, a certain point. Um, but uh, so it's, it's, it is, it is really nice to, to hear that it, it was conveyed because I, I do love the story. And I think the character Tysme has this beautiful monologue played by uh, Senora Michelle Blas, who's incredible, absolutely was so wonderful to work with. And in our rehearsals, we had wonderful conversations about, about the story that she tells in this monologue. It goes over like the history of the village and, and the famine that they went through and why they made the decision not to have kids and, and how that came to be. Um, and it, it is a really, a really powerful point in, in the story, I feel. Um, and I feel like your character, I mean, your whole character is a monologue. It's one huge, long, beautiful, powerful, emotional monologue. And um, um, yeah, it's, I, I think it's just, it is, it is really amazing that we're getting to explore these characters and their stories in this format. And the fact that we're all in different places right now and we can be talking about it uh, is, is very exciting to me. Yeah, it's like on a big, on a, on a, a bigger, um, from a bigger lens is the entire thing is kind of, it, it, it unites, it unites this work, Chamorros with the Chamorros here in Guam and Saipan as well. And, and it's just, that's what we need. We need to come together. You know what I mean? There's just so many divisions and this is one way, one way out of many ways that people can come together is through the arts. And that's why I really love this and I loved I would love to be a part of more projects under this organization and Madison Scott I met her in person in class for the first time and I was almost starstruck not a lot of my classmates knew who she was but because I keep up I keep up with uh, news regarding theater and when she came into the class I was like oh my god you're Madison Scott and she's like oh yeah you should take an acting class I was like, yes, I will. <laughs> I will. But anyway, she's um, she taught me, she taught me this really simple tip that I'm gonna apply to everything now. She said, when it comes to theater and you, and it comes to um either making a film or doing a play, 
Is it, is it necessary? Is it true? And what's the other one? Is it, um, I think those are the two main ones. Is it necessary? Is it true? Because it can be entertaining. It can, but you have to have, you have to connect with your audience. And that's what I love about this. It really connects to me and it connects to the listeners who may be going through the same thing. If you look at the news, there's almost every day there's a rape case. There's a rape uh, or sexual assault related uh, news article. And you don't know what they're going through, what the victims are going through. So if by any chance that person or the person's family stumbles upon this uh, podcast series and they hit episode five, they can relate and know that they're not alone. Oh, thank you for that. Seduce Masi. Oh, uh, Reed, go ahead. The one thing I just want to mention is like something y'all have brought up multiple times. It's just the community aspect of this, of this project. And I just, I have to call out that like being, I, Jaina and Joyce, I'm sure you can relate. Being diasporic tomorrow, man, is like lonely at times. Like being, being outside of, uh, not on an island is lonely and like when I listened to Chunka Nidzuk I was like it sounds like my family <laughs> you know what I mean I was sitting in my car and I was like this is how we talk and also like listening to Badass Mermaids listening to all of them really like hearing a Chad accent you know what I mean like hearing a Chad accent is like just so heartwarming because who else is going to know, right? And how many times in American theater are we going to hear someone say japlu or uh, kuduku? You know what I mean? Or kaksika? You know what I mean? We're not going to hear that. Like hearing those words, oh, oh, we know. And it's such a community-driven experience. Like it brings us together. I was sitting in my car like, we just like kaksika on Spotify. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Senor. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> it's a powerful point. We should all reflect on Jablu Kaksika. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, it's what I, you know, it's what I always tell people. It's what I always tell my language students. Even if you're, even if you are in the states, start using some tomorrow. You know, and then uh, what's it called? In a few months, everyone at Walmart's going to be saying Dogen and and Taki. Just just start doing that. I mean, I, I'll never forget the, the student that I had uh, when I was teaching at UOG who, who said he convinced everyone in his dorm that he was the Prince of Guam uh, when he was out in the States. And then he, uh, one of them like called him or, oh wait, one of was, was texting him during class. And he said, Senor, can you like, uh, can you like tell my friend that I'm really the Prince of Guam? And I was like, absolutely. Nihita Togesi, let's do this. <laughs> and so but you know what i love about hearing all of this um and and you know anyone can respond we've we brought out so many issues but what i love about it though is that thinking back at least thinking back to like my parents my grandparents they were proud in some ways of who they were but they also felt like they needed to hide those things you need to hide the language you needed to hide you couldn't be too tomorrow right if you think back to how uh, there was so much emphasis on Americanizing after the war so that if you spoke, you know, that's where the idea of Chad comes out originally, right? Is that you sound so tomorrow and that's bad. You're supposed to be sounding more like you have fallen out of a, a Sears catalog or, you know, that that sort of you were, you were cut out of the Brady Bunch. That's what you're supposed to sound like, right? You're not supposed to sound like that. And so... Um, but isn't it amazing just sort of the feelings of pride that we have nowadays and sort of, and then I love the way that you're using creativity, performance, you know, all of these things to just, to just show that. And so would anyone like to respond to that? Again, just a, just a little bit. So I, I spoke a lot already, but um, you know, I, I'm still growing up in a house of women that, we were born in the 50s and I'm seeing a lot of um, like <clears throat> differences in how they perceive the Chamorro culture versus how I perceive it. Whenever I want to go out there and be, for example, protest, they would say, no, look what, look what happened to Angel Santos. 
he got arrested. Don't be like that. They're going to think you're crazy. And I'm, and then, you know, it's just hard. It really is hard. But I, at the same time, I respect it because I can't, it's almost like arguing with the, with the wall because I understand they grew up in a different time. But at the same time, we're learning from each other. They learn, they're learning a lot about today's social issues and how it kind of, it's almost like, um, how do I say it? <clears throat> um, I'm in the right time and the right place right now. And when you say that um, about the hiding thing, that that hush hush culture, it really is, it, it exists still today. And this project right here just made me feel like um, <clears throat> it was it was a perfect opportunity to not be hushed, to break the silence basically in a creative way. <clears throat> so yes, thank you very much, Breaking Wave Theater Company and Reed Floors. <laughs> <Yeah. Specifically. laughs> and I, Joyce, did you have something to, or Jaina? I see yeah. Jaina, yeah, pop in. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, they're ready. They are ready to go. <laughs> I um I I really resonate with with that you know the differences between generations because as someone who who grew up in in the states uh, I definitely felt I felt the effects of the Ameri like the, the effects of the Americanization I feel it like I feel like I am I am the product of it in a way in some forms and and it it has led to a lot of like insecurity in my Chamorro identity and I really relate to what Reed said at the beginning about you know being questioned of like well what makes you Chamorro how can you claim that identity. Um, and, uh, in the past couple of years, I've, I've kind of been on a, on a journey to personally reconnect, um, and, and feel, feel connected with the islands and with my family, with the culture and to learn more of the history. Um, and one of those ways is by listening to this very podcast, <laughs> uh, this is Fanatsu is one of my favorite podcasts and, uh, my roommate definitely knows your voice and you'll get because I'll play it in the kitchen from time to time. Um, so, which is, which is really cool. Um. But as, as I've been reconnecting, uh, it's, it's been a joy because I've seen like my family talk more about culture and talk more about experience and talk more about our history. And um, when I was in Guam this, this summer, you know, talking to my grandpa and my, and my grandma about like the theater work I was doing and, and what we were exploring, I started to hear more stories from him and um, about his experience. And, and I just realized like sometimes it just takes asking the question, you know, like, like they won't always share, but if, but if you ask, they, they may tell you. Um, and as I've been reconnecting in the past couple of years, like my mom has been reconnecting. She was in your tomorrow zoom class for a while. And, and I hope she gets back into it again too. But um, she's also been, been listening to the things that I'm listening to and, and learning from what I'm learning because she, she grew up in that time where um, Americanization was, was prevalent and, and uh, speaking good English was important and, and not speaking as much tomorrow at home so that you could speak good English in school was, was kind of the mentality that, that she grew up in. So it's really just been, just, it's just been such a beautiful thing to witness. It's like, I am trying to reconnect and feel rooted in my culture and identity and seeing my mom also join me on, on that journey because she grew up in Saipan. So, you know, there's a lot of times I'm like, she shouldn't feel any insecurities or any doubts about who she is, but, but there are a lot of people who still do because there are a lot of things that feel like they were taken away, um, which is why projects like this are so important because, because we're making sure that the stories are told. And I feel like in the beginning of this process, there was a lot of that doubt about like, am I, am, am, am I allowed to tell these stories? Do I have the right to be doing this? But through doing it and through being in community with other Chamorros and and, um, and sharing these stories, I, I found a lot of, of empowerment in it. Um, and it's the fact that like, I'm not telling the story alone and this is not just my story, but we are telling it as a community. And that, that is where I feel the this, this strength in, 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 um, in culture. Yeah. No, I, thank you so much for sharing that. And it's, yeah, it's, it's so true. I mean, if we think about, if we think about, uh, like even when I was growing up, because I, I I am older than all of you. I'm quite Yezuki no Todo Samsu. So feel free to fanging me if you want to, and uh feel free to 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 bring me something to drink if you see me at a party or 
get a plate of food ready for me. Don't cut in front of me in line, Lanya. You know, and yeah. so uh, just, yeah. but uh, <laughs> it was mossy. But thinking back to when I was growing up, you know, if you if somebody asked me, and I had a similar experience where I went to, you know, I was born on Guam, went, moved out to California, and one of my friends was like, "You're from Guam? What's what's that?" And I was like, uh, you know, it's an island. And then they're like, uh, so what are you then? Are you like Guamish? Are you Guamanese? Like, what are you? And I was like, no, I think we're Chamorro. I think we're Chamorro. Uh, and he's like, so what is that? Do you, do you speak a language? And I was like, man, you know, my grandparents speak it. I, I don't know it. And then he was like, well, then you're not really that, are you? Because you can't speak it. And I was like, mm. and yeah, and, I, I, and so at that time, if you know, if you whether you were in Guam or whether you're in the States, you could point to your family and say, I'm Chamorro because of my parents or my grandparents or this. But what what else could you point to? Everything around you came from the United States, right? So you couldn't point at a book, really. You couldn't point at a movie. You could you could definitely point at a record player, eight-track player, cassette tapes. You could point at some music, right? But that's what's amazing about nowadays, though, right, is that you can even say if if you are on the other side of the world, if you are a foreign exchange student in Siberia and some one of Putin's enemies asks you, what's your culture? You say, oh, there's a podcast series that you should listen to. That rep that presents my culture in a way which is humorous, compelling, profound and contemporary. And then send them the link, and that's but that's what's amazing about nowadays is that uh, is that uh, we don't have to sort of feel, you know, that if you if you feel uh, empty or rootless or lost, there's so much more possibility though, for you to find community, for you to find resources, for you to find something to help you with that, and so, but yes, and so Joyce, I wanted to give you a chance to uh, to sort of yeah. to chime. In. Um, I just, I'm getting real emotional just hearing, right, everyone speak, I think. Um, oh, I'm crying, crying. I think it's been a huge thing. It's a huge thing, right? It's why, why I'm crying. It's why I do theater. It's why, um, and I'm just going to uh, kind of. Oh, no. Oh, oh no. Okay. Any, but uh, hopefully Joyce will be right back to sort of finish her thought because I was I was getting ready I was I was getting my I was getting my tear ducts ready for whatever she was about to say I was I was imagining I was gonna if I had better technical abilities I was gonna play remember me from Coco in the background or something uh, as she was about to share okay and again all right there Joyce is back the universe saying girl calm down you're embarrassing us. <laughs> um, no, I'm going to share this, this really sweet story. Cause a lot of people are like, why Nashville? You know, what are you doing? And it's a really hard journey. Cause I can't, I've in, as I've grown up and I've, I've come into my MAGA hot gut, I don't have to explain my path. I don't have to explain my dream. And um, it has always been a thing that, you know, representation is so important. I've always been so proud to be tomorrow. But the more that you say, I am, whatever, opinions will come into place. People will say, what makes you think? Just because I'm saying I am tomorrow and I want to take with space does not take away from your tomorrow or who can be in this space, right? A rising tide will raise all ships. And I think people forget that. Um, but one other thing that I wanted to bring in is, right, I, first thing was my niece and nephew Damon and Savannah are in Trunkanidza. They're six and 10. And the first time in a recording booth, right, they're talking about Guam stories. It made me so emotional. It's like, they're going to grow up in a place where they can see our words and our faces in books at bestseller, right? Like, that's huge. I didn't see that growing up. They're going to go, you know, going to the movie theater, seeing like the tsunami thing made me emotional. They're going to see, right? Like, that's huge, right? McKenna, like, oh my gosh. And then now, right? podcast plays movies like that's the dream the dream is for us to see ourselves right and any variation of how can we how can we raise that tide um but this i've been in nashville for a little bit and i'm, I'm like why am i here and I'll, I'll i'll harken back to why so i'm doing the shakespeare tour 
right? Which is very, as far away from being tomorrow as humanly possible, right? But I'm a big person of like, I really enjoy text. I enjoy history. I enjoy how do, they, how do things survive time? And in a way, it's really fascinating for me to study something like Shakespeare and see how that survives. And then also to be like, well, I've been, um, the people that I'm from have been around longer than Shakespeare and yet we survive, right? So I'm doing this show in the middle of nowhere corner of Tennessee. I'm in the middle of nowhere. We're in the sticks. I'm like, why am I on this tour? <laughs> I'm like, what am I doing? And I get this message from this boy, I'm oh, emotional on Instagram, who doesn't have social media. And he messages me. He's like, Miss Joyce, I'm from Guam. My family has not been on Guam, like we're diaspora. And I've never seen a Chamorro person on stage. And I didn't know we were allowed to do that. And I said, what? And I felt so bad. I was already on, you know, we were on our tour bus back home. And I was like, I want to hug this boy so hard. I was like, you can do whatever you want. Being from Guam does not limit you in any way. And um, you deserve to be on that stage. You deserve to be seen as someone who's Chamorro. And I think for us here at Breaking Wave, that has been the dream, right? Because I'm sorry, I'm so tired of seeing Miss Saigon. I'm so tired of seeing these stereotypical freaking variations of who they think we are. But there's something so comforting about hearing an Auntie Bobby there's something so comforting about hearing the freaking rooster crow about, right, an ocean. Like, these are things that will mean nothing to anyone, but they'll mean everything to us. And that's what we want to do. Honor what means, you know, it means something to us and that's what matters. And I think with these stories, which we want to be the first wave of this, is it's, you know, this is us experimenting. And we were like, people might hate it. People might love it, but we have to do it because we have to see, right, right. We're, we're building. We can't create the world in a day. And so we're so really, really happy that it resonates with people because we didn't know people might hate it. You know, some people will have opinions about it, but we love that because we're happy that it's not at a perfect launch because we want it to be better. We want it to be the best that it can be. And um, we want people to know that this is just the beginning, right? This is just the very beginning. And um, and you will see more of Jaina. You will see more of Reed. You will see more of Brie. Like, I think that's what's so inspiring is you're seeing these amazing people in their fields at the beginning. And I think even with you, you know, um, we're just seeing you, Miguel, the trajectory is, is far, <laughs> it's forward. And this is the very beginnings of it. And something like a podcast play is small. But there is, again, something about turning that on and being able to see, I being able to say, I can listen to this podcast play in my car with my Bluetooth connected to the interwebs, however that works. And you hear yourself back, right? In the same way that Americans get that opportunity, this is how we give ourselves an opportunity. This is the way we, right? And I always say it, it's like, it's so basic, right? It's, it's even how revolutionary Nihi was. I remember turning on my Instagram for the first time, seeing a Nihi video and crying. And I was like, now what is happening? And I'm like, it's so small. It's so small. Change happens in that way. Um, and representation, man, is so, so important. And and again, thank you for having us here and to table talk oh. about it. And I'm happy to hear that people like it. <laughs> I think that's the part that at the end of the yeah. day that they're not like burn it, trash it. They've been canceled. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank yeah. you for giving well, me the space you. to talk about that. See, just want to Joyce for sharing that story. You could, and uh, everyone can only see Joyce, but every, those of you watching can only see Joyce, but everyone else was tearing up and turning their cameras off or, or uh, as she, as she was sharing. But I, I think, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've covered so much and we've really learned sort of about the power of, uh, of art in general, but even sort of what, what you are all doing. And I wanted to give us sort of a last chance to share more about uh, what Breaking Wave is doing, what Breaking Wave has, has sort of in the works. Cause I've, uh, I can tell you this, that, uh, you know, going off what Joy said that, you know, plays on Guam used to be whatever UOG was doing. And then uh, and then also sort of a, every once in a while, a Miss Saigon from an ambitious middle school uh, teacher <laughs> or something like that. And so it has been amazing to see what Breaking Wave, though, has been putting out there. 
And so um, Joyce, if you want to, or anyone else, if you want to kind of talk about, I'm putting the website up and I've I've uh, posted it on the on the live stream as well. And so uh, if you want to share sort of what you what you all have planned. Yeah, um, we do have the Pave the Wave, which is an event that's coming up in December, which more information will be coming out very soon. Um, information will be dropping sometime within the next week. We also have summer, uh, th a theater camp for kids happening in the summer of next year as well, 2023, look out for that. Um, and it's gonna be one of those things where I think it'll be all inclusive and free. So look out for that if you've been listening and you wanna get your kids into some variation of art. And I wanna hand it off to Jaina, um, who is the heart and soul of this project that I'm also co-directing and, and, and co-producing, but the oral storytelling project. Jaina, can you give us a little bit of a snippet of what's to come? Yes. Yes, I can. Uh, the oral storytelling project, uh, I, I've, it's, it's been in the works since January of, of this year. Uh, very slow progression, but um, this past summer we had a two week writers workshop with a phenomenal team of five tomorrow writers. They all conducted an interview with a family member and now we're in the development phase and they're writing pieces inspired by the stories that their family member has shared with them. So uh, we're working on this development. Um, through till March, we just got a fellowship from an organization called Cultural Survival to fund our development phase, which is very exciting. Um, and so in March, we're planning on having a Zoom reading of the works in progress and hoping to do a production in summer of 2023. And hopefully Joyce and I will be back on Guam for that, fingers crossed. Yeah, but it's just been such, it's been such a joy to, I was working on the oral storytelling project simultaneously while I was doing the podcast plays um, and I, I, I need to shout out Breaking Wave and CJ and all the work that she does behind the scenes, because while a podcast may seem small, the amount of work that went into every single episode, every single Zoom meeting, every single recording session, our editors, the amount of time they spent sound designing and editing everything, like it took a massive team, um, a massive team to put it together uh, and, and a lot of work from each member. So it, it, it really, it, it takes a village um, and I just appreciate the fact that Breaking Wave is, is supporting these kind of works and creating opportunities for artists in Guam and in the diaspora to be telling these stories because it's really important. Representation does matter, absolutely. Uh, and who else is going to tell them if it's not us? So. Let's, I wanted to give everyone a, a chance to share some final thoughts with those watching. We've, we've, gotten, we've gotten some Biba comments. We've gotten a, a few uh, Hafa days. We had a, Tina Mendoza commented saying, one thing for sure about us, we are very compassionate people. We love to share and we care deeply. And then a, a heart emoji. And so, uh, Masi to all of you, but final thoughts. Final thoughts, and sort of let's let's start off with uh, Reed. If you have anything, and and you can pass if you want to. You can uh, you can be the tomorrow sitting in the back of the class and not say anything, and pray Me to too. Santa Macamela that no one calls on you. <laughs> no, no, okay. <laughs> and I just I just I just want to say a sincere like. Puluki nights up at our Samzo. You know, I'm so so grateful, and I, um. To, to have been a part of the project. And uh, the fact that Punta en Dos Amantes was brought up was like, it just feels very exciting. Um, it's, a, it's been a thought in my head, but it's also, I feel like Breaking Wave came along at such an important time in so many people's lives. So I just, I can't express the gratitude I have, um, especially for Joyce Ney and CJ. Um, just so much love and so much appreciation to do a Um, I'll pass it to Jaina. Yeah, gratitude, so much gratitude. It really means the world to have this community when I'm all the way on the other side of the world in cold Boston, Massachusetts. <laughs> um, and also just with these podcast plays, it's, it's been nice uh, to share it with the people in my life out here in the States. Uh, I feel like I've, I, I can explain over and over and over again where Guam is and where Saipan is and what Chamorro is, but having a podcast for people to hear it. Like I've had, I've had friends reach out to me and be like, hey, I listened to it. Like, it was really beautiful. Like I, I learned so much by listening to this podcast. And so I think it's, it's amazing for our community and the fact that we can, we can educate others outside of our community about, about who we are and where we come from. 
So, so much gratitude. I'll pass it to Bree. Sisa Smasi Jaina, who gof agradesi ha todos. My message um, is to actually the men who have been watching this, or um, if they ever, ever, you know, hit that button and decide to listen to, to us. Um, I encourage you to finish, to stay in school, finish your education, pursue your dreams. And um, there's, if you're interested in acting, if you want to be an artist, if you want to be a musician, you can do it and you can do it here on your island. You don't have to go anywhere else. The University of Guam is just right outside. But it's, it's, it's really close by. I'm not saying that she can't go off island for college, but you know we have a college here that would love to have you, and hope maybe you can make a difference too uh, on the island by just going to UOG and meeting all these wonderful people that help pave the way for the future for future generations. So thank you, thank you, Fanatsu, thank you, Breaking Wave, thank you, Jaina, Reed, Joyce. I'm just overwhelmed with gratitude right now. Yes. <clears throat> and Joyce? Uh, on a lighter note, um, I just want to say thank you as well, Sinem Aussie, to everyone that's listening, to everyone in this Zoom room. Um, and, you know, I think if there's anything that we can't stress enough is that, um, yes, hearing stories via a podcast are beautiful and wonderful but the best stories you will ever hear will come directly from Auntie Bobby herself. Um, everyone has an Auntie Bobby in their life. You have a Nana, a Tata, an uncle, an aunt. Like, believe me, as I tell you now, like you will want to speak to them. Ask your Nana, ask your mom, ask your dad, talk to them. Storytelling is in our blood, you know, right? Whether it's dramatic or, you know, funny, like, there are so many things. And, and I think the older that we get, we're so attached to our phones and wherever you are listening, yes, there's some technology and we love that, but also take the time to talk, talk to family members, talk to friends, like storytelling is what we do. It's how we commune. It's how we share um, where we are in the world and what our views are. Just talk, listen, um, engage. And if you're listening in the diaspora, you're not alone. And we love you. We appreciate you. And um, being Chamorro is a superpower. Tap in. <laughs> Join us. <laughs> yeah. Be yeah. bad if you love being Chamorro. Be bad. Be And let me share one final comment that has come in from uh, Dana. Situs Masi, Dana, you are, you are one of our most loyal fans and patrons on Patreon. And she says, I'm very excited to start listening to your podcast on my commute starting tomorrow. So much talent and passion in the Chamorro community. Biba will share with everyone I know, especially my nieces and nephews. And so, Sidus Masi Tatlu Dena. And so, Sidus Masi No Hamzu Todos Ni Mangagi Yihalami Zoom. Thank you to all of you in the Zoom uh, for all of this wonderful work. And I definitely look forward to uh, the second series in this. I definitely want Punta Dos Amantes, but I definitely want it with a queer angle for sure. Um, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm putting it out there. I'm putting it out there that I think that would be a good one. And, but, si dus masi put todui bidan mimizuz and hamzu lokwi nu me egad zanu me ekungok si dus masi esti ifenapu estin episode fenatsu. Ajos, esteki manat li hit